Well, greetings, everyone. Glad to have you join me today. We're looking at best practices to strengthen academic relationships with students. There's things that we can do in study group programs and in the classroom as faculty members that can help to strengthen the relationships with students, help them to develop a sense of belonging, which can equal retention and graduation rates. That's the reason why all of this is so important. Developing a sense of inclusion and also fighting against racism. Hopefully in this discussion, I'm going to be able to try to be able to make some connections among all of these concepts here. This was a presentation that I gave with the College Reading and Learning Association Heartland Conference back in 2021. And what I'd like to draw your attention to is to this web link that's down here in the middle of the page then. Highly recommend that you go to this site because the PowerPoint slides and all the reference materials that I'm going to talk about during the talk are all going to be there and you can be able to download all of those. The thing that I do is that I follow the admonition of my college students, which is don't read all the PowerPoint slides to us word for word. And I'll encourage you to do the same. If I kind of start moving along a little quickly, well, feel free to use the pause button in order to be able to look at the slide a little more, consider all of the points that are on it, particularly if I'm making reference to some other resource material that's available on the website. So you can go there and take your leisure in being able to look at those then. First thing to do is I always have to say thank you to all the people who taught me what it is that I have to share today. That's the peer study group leaders, um, conference participants from Australia back in 2019, the reviewers for what's called the CLA guidelines. We're going to talk more about that coming up here in a couple of minutes. And also my colleagues in the field. All of these people have made the difference for giving me what it is that I have to share with you today. What is it that influences students? Well, this is just simply a very basic little outline of what it is that has an impact on students, and this doesn't represent everything. If we really want to take a look at it, take a look at Alexander Aston's uh, research. He and his colleagues came up with a study that looked at the impact on students. And it is um, one of the most famous of all of the research studies that's ever been done. He identified nearly 300 variables that have an impact. About 100 variables that students bring with them into the college environment about a hundred different variables that have an impact on them while they're in the college environment. And then finally, what are the outcomes from the college experience? Well, it's nearly a hundred of them as well. So I always recommend you take a look at those. I just simply want to illustrate this just graphically and to highlight peer-assisted learning and tutoring programs as one of those things that are so influential. Part of the reason why those are so influential along with these other ones along here is that these are what I would call the first line influencers on students. These are the ones that are going to have the places where conversations are going to take place people who end up the student, oftentimes student paraprofessionals that are leading these various organizations, excuse me, not for the instructors, but athletics, residence hall assistants, and the rest, they're the ones that are going to first notice what's going on with students. And it's critical, particularly as this session is going to emphasize a great deal about peer study group programs, 
It's so important that all of these individuals have training how to be able to make referrals to all of the campus resources that are on campus. So I just wanted to make a point to uh, emphasize that. Well, what is it we already know about building strong relationships with students, which is going to lead directly to more engagement with the learning environment, creating a more inclusive place for the students to feel like that they have a place, a home, and an openness to learning new ideas well, one of those I talked about, Dr. Aston before, in fact, um, looking down here at the bottom of the screen, if you've never taken a look at this, you can probably pick up this book secondhand. It dates back to 1993, but all of the research on student outcomes continues to replicate the findings that came out. And what Dr. Aston and all of his colleagues and the graduate students involved in the research, they all found out through understanding, well, how do you understand college impact? Well, it's the time of the exposure. When does it start? Well, it starts immediately. The intensity of the exposure, how much uh, during a particular time period and then it's the synergy. It's this equation of quantity times quality of the exposure. And that's the reason why he talked about it was so important to have first-line resources for students from the first day. Because this is all going to begin on the very first day that the students interact on the college environment. And that's the reason why he was so emphatic about how is it that we are trying to make a difference with the programs and what's going on inside the classroom. This is coming from the field of customer service. So in terms of restaurants and businesses and such, they talk about this issue of moments of truth. A moment of truth is something that is a specific event in time. It's when the customer comes into contact with some aspect of the organization and has an experience with its service. Customers every single time are going to evaluate whether the price they've paid, time or money, equals or exceeds the value of what they were promised. So we tend to think about this in terms of why do you go to Starbucks or you go to someplace else? Is it their experience worth it even though the cost is a little bit more? Or can you apply this to the campus environment? And that's what the leaders in organizations like Noel Levitt's which is the biggest, uh, most influential organization for training us how to be able to create more conducive campus environments for students to persist and to graduate from the institution. The question is, is what kinds of moments of truth are our students experiencing whenever they're on campus? Well, one relationship can make the difference. And as you notice here, one person, according to the research, it doesn't make any difference who the person is. They can be a student, they can be an advisor, they can be an instructor, maintenance worker, food service, and goes on and on. It helps to explain, explain why it is that non-academic activities can be so influential. And we just give a little sample down there with Greek life, clubs, athletic teams, jobs, uh, the band, and so much more, all of those things have an influence on students whether or not they're going to stay at the institution or not. What is a staying environment from the college, uh, American College Testing Program? It's once again, this actually research dates back here to the 1980s. It's a feeling of belonging being integrated into the social fabric of the institution. How many chances do you have for personal involvement at the institution? What is your positive identity? How do you feel about yourself? And how has the outside environment 
having an impact upon how you're feeling about yourself and also your self-esteem. So all of these things are having a tremendous impact on whether or not you're going to be successful at school. A question for you. Is a sense of belonging received from the campus climate or generated within a person? I'll let you think about that just for a moment. You'll see a number of these kinds of discussion questions. My suggestion is, is pause the video, consider the question, come up with your own answer, and then see how we discuss that following. Well, Tinto talks about what is it that has a big influence on whether or not you're going to stay at the institution. Now, I've used this particular PowerPoint slide probably dating back 35 years at least. Uh, whenever I used to do lots of presentations about the supplemental instruction program, which I worked with at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and the National Center for SI at that time. I'll have to admit, I tended to focus on these top two issues up here when I talked about why was it that supplemental instruction was so helpful to students. Well, it helped them to deal with the difficulty level they were experiencing inside of the course and their worry about whether or not they're going to do well on the exams. And also I talked about incongruence, that what students were thinking wasn't necessarily aligned with what the professor was saying and what was, conduced, or what was contained inside of the textbooks and the assigned readings. And if you can't make the connections among those three, then you end up experiencing incongruence. And the assumption you make about yourself is, I don't belong here because none of this seems to make any sense. You don't actually blame the teachers and you don't blame the reading material. You end up assuming it's about me and I don't belong. Well, what Tinto also was telling us inside of these themes of attrition, reasons for people dropping out, are mostly social ones down here on the bottom. Difficulty making an adjustment to the surroundings. Being very isolated when you're on campus or uh, regardless wherever you're living at, your experience is you walk into a class you feel like a loner, you sit down, you experience incongruence, and then you walk out and you wonder, why am I doing this? And then also you end up falling in with social groups that maybe aren't being as supportive as what you're trying to experience as you're going uh, through the college experience. So what has Tinto been up to in recent years? And this is kind of where we're going to be focusing a great deal for our conversation today. It's a sense of belonging. You know, Tinto is well known for all of his books and research about predicting why do students drop out. Well, in the past couple of decades, he turned his research interests and was identifying how is it that we keep students included they have a sense of belonging, and how do they persist till they complete whatever their goals are academically? Well, what he found was that students have got to see themselves as members of a community, either um, for faculty or for students, which is our major uh, focus for today. And it talks about what kind of a campus climate that they have, and they perceive the college as welcoming and has a culture of inclusion. Boy, isn't that one of our words that you see a great deal, but it's actually been in the research literature for decades. Learning occurs in communities, and that's something that Dr. Tinto has been emphasizing so much in his research. I'm going to talk to you about a number of ways that belonging expresses itself. What's it really look like? 
And much of this came from interactions with the uh, students and the faculty and the staff at a SI PASS conference. PASS is a name that is often used for uh, referring to things that look like supplemental instruction. Uh, PASS, peer-assisted study sessions, there's other definitions that are, that are used out there. But one of the things that I want to emphasize is what are the lessons that I learned from these people in addition to what I've read in the professional literature? So I want to give proper attribution to my Canadian, or excuse me, to my Australian colleagues. And these are slides that are going to have so much information on them, I'm not going to try to hit all of the major points because I can't. These are all distilled down from hours of conversation and small group discussions with them at the conference back in 2019. But what I want to emphasize is, number one, belonging comes from a welcoming and an encouraging environment. Each one of these bullet points here are ways that you can take action in order to help to facilitate that environment and making sure that it is encouraging and welcoming. Whether it be things like icebreakers in order to generate energy, a way to learn names, and also to start the conversation, the SI leader, or whatever you call your program, sits among the students rather than in front of the students, not in front, but is part of the conversation. And the leader establishes a friendly and a relaxed environment. All the other bullet points are just as important, but I just wanted to pick out a couple of those that I thought were significant. Another one is talking about developing personal relationships. It's so important to learn student names. We were very lucky at where I worked at the University of Minnesota. I ended up receiving two weeks ahead of time a list of all the students in my class and their photographs from their student IDs. And it made it easier for me to memorize students' names and faces. They so appreciated that, and they particularly those who were from outside the U.S. or had uh, traditions and cultures from outside, it was important that you had correct pronunciations. So that's the reason why for me as a faculty member, that was part of my two weeks was to prepare for names that I was unfamiliar with but could be able to correctly pronounce them. Nowadays, I make a point to do the same whenever I get in the car for a Lyft or a Uber ride, and they so appreciate that, both for my students as well as my uh, Lyft drivers nowadays. But understanding cultural backgrounds about students and giving students an opportunity to be able to talk. And that's the reason why um, individual talk from having office hours, that provides an opportunity for the individual conversations. And I've noticed that many of the study group programs now are now having their study group leaders have office hours for one or two hours per week. Oftentimes, they use that time in order to help prepare for other uh, upcoming sessions, but it gives opportunities in order to personalize the conversation. It just isn't a group of students plopping down in a room and then starting to talk about the academic content material. It's important that students be treated as individuals and giving them that opportunity to develop that. One of the things that's so important is that normalizing challenges. It means that simply it's normal to go through the challenges. And the SI leader, I keep using that term there, sorry about that, the peer study group leader, shares about their own challenges with the life-school-work balance. I did the same thing as a faculty member with my students, and they so appreciated it. On the first day of class, I shared about how I was first-generation college. 
my difficulties in navigating the campus, talking about how my grades weren't the best and it was uh, would have been maybe a challenge for me to have been accepted at the University of Minnesota as a student and how lucky I was that I got hired on as a faculty member. Usually the students laugh with that, but part of why they laugh is because of nervousness that many students have a feeling that they don't belong. You know, they talk about how it's the um, syndrome of not feeling like you belong at the institution. And that is shared by so many people. You deal with their own anxiety uh, while they're in school and in their life then. The leader of the study group shares about their feelings of impostorship. That's what I was trying to say when I was saying that I'm not so sure I really belonged here at the University of Minnesota. A lot of students have a feeling of that, of impostorship and of life simply itself, not even belonging in any college, any place. And also they share about how this is a place in order to develop new friendships and become more involved in college activities. So the study group program can be a fostering place that not only start up connections uh, between them and their students, but also to help them to develop connections with other people on campus. This issue about failure is becoming more and more important. Many students worry all the time about failing. And the idea that normalizing failure is really important. Once again, the study group leader can share their fails. And one of the things that's so important is that you can fail an event, but that does not mean that you're a failure, which is a character trait. That's a really deep concept. I've been working on an article here in the past couple of years about all the failures that I've experienced in my life and how they actually bridged me to A, learning lessons, B, sending me to further places on my journey. They're events, they're not character traits. And that's not a trite set of words. Think about that deeply and about how it is that your study group leaders or you as a faculty member or you as a director of a grant program can be able to communicate that. And I really have got to tell you, that is a deep concept that bothers a lot of students. They think about this as talking about them. They think that they need to exit the university because they don't belong, because they don't measure up. No one's ever told them failing their way to success. And failure is a simply an event that happens along their life journey. Each student has an active role inside of the session. And that's where you end up having small groups of two and three. They engage in activities in order to talk with each other. They meet people, get them to change up these small groups from session to session. Encourage the students to, um, through giving them specific praise for each student when they participate in the session and on something in particular that they engage in. Lots of students get the opportunity to share, and group sessions are set up so that everyone has a part in them. So it's so critical that students feel active, they're going to feel more inclusive, and they're going to feel like it's a more meaningful event for them to participate in. Relevance of the group sessions. 
Well, it's important also that there, you as a study group leader, and frankly, you as a faculty member, can also show how does this material relate to the academic majors, advanced courses, and to life and reality. Because theoretical knowledge is important, but sometimes students feel overwhelmed if they can't see the relevance. They need to see the connections. They need to see explicit connections made between the course readings and the lectures because oftentimes faculty members will not do that for them. Faculty members will do things like this. There's limited time. I'm going to share what I know. I'm counting on you to read this material and here's a study guide, and it's the last thing that the faculty member ever says about the material. So for you in a study group, you've got the opportunity to help make the major points, the connections between previous and upcoming units, and simply an opportunity to make this relevance to life. That's why it's so critical for your involvement. What's the difference between inclusion and belonging? I suggest that you stop the video here for a moment and think about that, and then I'll end up sharing something with you in a few moments. This was the answer that we came up with with our discussion. Inclusion is about what the institution is doing. And it's really something that comes from the outside. It also could be the faculty member. Belonging, well, that's something from the student's point of view, and that's something that's going to end up coming from the inside. I, I like this graphic here because it just simply reminds me that which is more important? Well, that's a false uh, answer or false question. They're all important. It's a sense of inclusion, which is related to belonging. And then all of that well, that's all going to have an impact on how I feel as a person. What is my identity? So in a sense, which is the most important? Well, it's all important. In the website that I showed you, and we're going to see that website address again, I put a little bibliography of articles that relate to study group programs that talk about belonging. And here was just simply one of those here that came out in 2020. I thought it was really particularly important because it talked about perceived belonging and belonging uncertainty. It's a really complex issue. And that's the reason why I think the professional literature could give you a really nice place to take a deep dive in to understand belonging more significantly. Female students, especially those from underrepresented minority groups, reported lower belonging and higher uncertainty than male students within the first weeks of the course. Well, what's that all mean? Well, it means that actions need to be taken some of the items that have been mentioned so far inside of uh, this short presentation would be really helpful, but also it gives a good reason for a deeper dive into the literature. So what are some final thoughts and resources? Well, these are some really important ones. All of these are available through the website that I've been talking about. Course-based learning assistance guide, this is a 100 plus page directory of best practices and policies for a peer study group program. 
These can help supplement your peer-led team learning, supplemental instruction, pass, pal, you name your program. These will not, uh, these would be good to help support what it is that you're already doing. A subset of this guide is this one. Anti-Racism Policies and Practices for Course-Based Learning Assistance. It's not soon to be embedded. Things have been rapidly changing since I did this talk just a year ago. It's already inside of this guide. This particular guide is probably about 35 plus pages long. That's just on practices and policies which are seeking to establish an anti-racist environment. You know, a long, long time ago, I'll have to admit, I was not as attuned to this issue. I think part of it was my own bias or privilege of being a white male. I've learned a lot in the last couple of years. I've learned that there's no such thing as a vacuum space for learning to occur. It's either biased or anti-biased. It's more than just simply, it's this issue here of anti-racism doesn't mean the absence of racism. It means something that actually changes with the way that you teach and you regulate and you develop rules. And part of all of that comes from this anti-racism glossary, which really helped to inform this particular a document up here. 48 really key terms that I think that you would find helpful. The thing that I think that is remarkable about this, this was created by Colleagues of Color for Social Justice, a new group that was formed in the past year and a half or so. What this group really did is that they not only give a meaningful, detailed definition but they also end up giving examples. And I think that you would find the examples to be enormously helpful. Some of them are going to be enormously painful to read. And that's the reason why the authors of this, there was like I think about a dozen or so who authored this directory of um, a glossary rather, they talked about how it was a painful process because they were unshielding or, or remembering things that they had placed into the back of their memory of things they really didn't want to think about anymore. And there were racial experiences of hatred and bias and the rest, but they went ahead and shared those. And I think that's the reason why this glossary would be really important reading. I also have a whole series of social media channels that are out there. The one that I want to emphasize is, let's see if it's in here, not here. Let me just back back up. Sorry about that. If you go into the podcasts, so go to davidmedia.org and then go into the podcast. One of the ones you'll find is the PAL podcast. And that one is made up of interviews with study group leaders and the directors of study group programs. Each of the interviews is only about 10 minutes long. It's not me talking to you. I ask some six or seven questions, and then we hear some real wisdom come from the study group leaders about what they're experiencing, what activities they've created, and what are some recommendations they have for their fellow study group leaders and the program managers. I think you would really find them meaningful. It's only about 10 minutes long. So, highly recommend that you go and you check that out. Also, if you end up going to that uh, website, you'll also find a couple of directories, which, excuse me, directories, a couple of books which were created by our study group leaders. 
One was called Tried and Tweaked uh, Activities to Re-Energize Peer Learning Sessions. Well, this one was uh, really created by the study group leaders. Same thing over there. Two or more heads are better than one. Adventures in Leading Group Learning, uh, a facilitator storybook. And the study group leaders share short stories, and they've all been organized according to themes. Highly recommend it. You can see the, um, let me just emphasize that. You can see the um, URLs that will take you directory to the PDF, and you can download that. I would highly recommend it and consider it for integration into the training program for your putty, uh, your peer study group leaders. Really outstanding. And it's really kind of scary to see some of the things that our peer study group leaders have to endure and how they overcome the challenges. This is just simply a little dictum. I know you're probably tired of seeing all the Star Wars quotations all the time. Well, these are two that I think are really important that have really spoken to me over the years. I've thought about what is it that's helped me to get ahead. And as I said earlier, partly it is dealing with failure and moving forward. Failure or failing is an act. It's not a character trait. I like this one from Yoda. No, try not, do or do not, there is no try. It talks about making a commitment to change or to implement something and to put your energy in. Sometimes it is going to fail. And that's the reason why you see the other quotation there from Yoda, the greatest teacher failure is. I actually believe that's probably some of the most profound pedagogy that I've ever read because it is really about dealing with failure and learning from it. Your commitment to change. Finally, we end up here with the final slide and that is, I would love to continue the conversation. That's the reason why I end up providing my email address. Here we've got the link to all the materials that were referred to inside of this short presentation. I also have my general website. And then specifically, if you just want to look at the peer learning resources, well, that's this uh, web address here then. I hope that we can keep up a conversation. I have a lot to learn. I'm a member of Colleagues of Color for Social Justice. Most of my time is spent listening to my colleagues, and I have learned so much. I do the same thing when listening to the students through the podcast for peer learning groups and also listening to my colleagues around the world. It's been such a wonderful ride. And I'm glad that you're watching the video, and I hope that you engage in conversation with me. Best wishes to you with your work.